And when Jesus drove out the money changers, we talked about the dove and how dove represents the peace. And there are many examples of this in the scriptures. Uh, um, anybody think of one? No? Huh? Okay, somebody else? Uh -huh. Yes, very good. Was the example when the, when the dove returned? Okay. Um, so the next one we have is, uh, and of course this piece right here, since this dove was driven out by Jesus, this is a false piece based on, you know, works or, you know, I mean, I, did, I didn't get into it a whole lot, but you can go a long way on this one. You know, there are some people that believe at peace at all costs, and if, they, and if they get in an argument with somebody or there's a, a, a feeling that things aren't right, they will do anything to have peace, you know, anything, you know, which means, you know, deny the Lord or, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, uh, uh, not stand up for the truth or this sort of thing. Uh-huh. Well, I would assume if they, if, yes, I would assume yes, because the scriptures, everything is there for a purpose. So ignore my order, but yeah, I would assume, I mean, I, I can't say that I've seen the significance of that order as of yet, but just knowing how the scriptures are, I would assume yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Amen. Um, Okay, so um, we're talking in relationship to peace then. Um, some people might take the scripture, blessed are the peacemakers, and go, okay, so every time there's a, there's a misunderstanding or whatever, maybe it's not a misunderstanding. Maybe you've stated the truth and they don't agree with you. And then you sense that they don't agree with you. So you automatically kick into the blessed are the peacemaker mode. Okay, is something Jesus said over here about blessed are the peacemakers going to contradict something over here about declaring the truth and being those who are the light of the world? No, it's not going to contradict. So that must mean that this blessed are the peacemaker concept over here is a dove that needs to be driven out of the what? The temple. Out of, you, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's right, driven out of you. Okay, so, you know, but it's funny because we have, we have scriptures where we validate certain actions. But like I said, if it's starting to contradict other things, then you should examine it a little more closely. And one of the things you'll find, too, is that uh, if, if you s stated the truth, they got upset with you, you make peace with them, you walk off, and they're thinking... Uh, you no longer believe the way that you believe, you believe the way they believe, there's usually kind of a yucky feeling for several reasons. One is because, because what? You betrayed the Lord or you didn't stand up for the truth or, you know, um, to be honest with you, this may sound funny, but I used to be that way. I mean, I would turn into jello. I just didn't, I didn't like arguments and maybe it had something to do with the way I was raised and all the disaster that was always going on but you know to ever find peace was like a wonderful thing but then you realize and, and uh, you know I mean Jesus was perfect he never had a wrong motive he never did anything against anybody in a wrong way he never sinned he never did anything and there was continual friction in his ministry and life and walk with everybody including the disciples including the you know everybody there's all this upheaval going on and you're going you know but we think if I'm following the Lord and if I'm letting the Lord live then everything's going to be rosy do you see how wrong that concept is it's, it's, it's wrong now I believe you can have peace within that doesn't mean that you might not even have turmoil in your soul but you can have peace in your heart peace in your spirit the peace of God can guard your heart and mind Okay, so um, just, just me jotting stuff down here, not necessarily the Lord's order. 
uh, oxen. Um, what do you think oxen would represent? Let's, let's say, it, first of all, everything that you're going to see, the devil does not create things. He just perverts things. He's not a creator. He didn't create the world. He didn't create water. He didn't create anything. He perverts things. So what would be the good or the right significance of oxen? Anybody? Pat? Okay, straight. Good. Has that got anybody else thinking? Okay. Okay, good. Laborers. Our workers. Jerry? Yeah, it is. Everything is going to be a type of Christ in one way or another. And to fulfill it, it must be fulfilled by Christ. Mallory? Okay, good. Um, anybody else? Okay, so laborer speaks of servitude or serving the master. You see what I mean? And do you see how if you don't really kind of press it just a little more, if you just go, okay, you go, okay, oxen, labor, okay, I got it. You may not really have anything yet, but if you think in terms of it is a labor because it is serving, uh, the oxen serves the desires, the, the intended desire of its master. So service in relationship to not just serving, because labor could, could denote just flat laboring or serving, but but serve service is different than just serving. Serving is, you know, you can go work at General Motors and be serving, but are you doing service? You know, Kelly. Okay, so now you're talking about the false spirit that Jesus would drive out of the temple. All right, so he drove out the oxen, <clears throat> and in that temple, in, in his eyes, he's not just seeing a building that belongs to God. He knows that that was meant to be a physical representation of a spiritual truth, and he can't even tolerate it in the natural. He has such zeal, for the scriptures say there, the zeal for the house of the... The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, which is different than most of our zeal. Most of our zeal is based on the moment or the excitement level or how it is presented in order to stimulate certain things in your soul. But this is a zeal for the house of the Lord that is a constant, and certainly is, since it is a constant, it rises for the occasion if some particular... So this zeal was a particular zeal in relationship to the house of the Lord. So when something is contrary to that, this zeal rises, you know. So you say, you know, I mean, it, it, it might be a little bit like, you know, walking into church Sunday morning and, and uh, people are, you know, a couple of people are sitting there on the second row and they're drinking beer. Hey, man, you know, I like this church. And me walking in and going, good morning, praise the Lord. Uh, but there, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, there is, if there is a general zeal, it's always there, but this is an opportunity to release it. But human zeal based on the soul is not such. Human zeal comes and goes depending on the emotional level and the, the highs and the things that are presented and whatever. It's not really even something that is innate in you, innate, that is within you that guides and characterizes you. It is something that if somebody beats a drum just right and shouts, charge, you might jump in. But you, once, you, once you charge the hill and you find your legs are getting tired, you also might drop out. Whereas a zeal for the Lord the way I'm describing it is constant. You can't help it. It's, it's greater than you. It's got you, not that you control it. Uh-huh.
Right. Right. Yeah, I can think of a lot of cases. But this one, right? This one reason why it takes so long to cover so much, because I mean, there's so much reality to be found. But uh, so another way that you you begin to approach this is okay. You have the oxen, and and a way to help open you up so the Holy Spirit can see uh, or can show you things is to be open to the law of contrast. The law of contrast, which would show, which would shine and contrast this with that. So you have oxen in the right way of the spirit of, and I like the spirit of service being the primary thing. That service represents serving another. It's not just serving. Because serving relates more to the act and deed that you're doing. Serve us, to me, speaks more of to whom you are doing or for whom you are doing. Big difference. To me, that's a big difference because it's a difference of things done or to whom it is being done for. And you'll find that if you, if, you, if you serve the Lord and you really do it to the Lord, a lot of times it doesn't matter what thing it is. It only matters when it's a false spirit. Here. So, let's contrast oxen, okay? Well, if it's, if it's a true oxen the way the Lord would, would have it, then it will serve properly, gladly, uh, by love serve one another. You, all the scriptures start coming to mind. There's a lot of, you know, things that come up. But if it's not, then there are, you, you contrast that with well, well, whatever other kind of cows are there that could be contrasted. Well, you could, uh, how about a, a prize heifer, you know, taken to be shown on the floor for everybody to admire and for it to receive a ribbon for its greatness or whatever. And, uh, you know, or a, or a breeding cow or something that is going to stand out on its own merit instead of for whom it serves. The real emphasis is my strength, you know, I, my strength or what I do or whatever. This is why Jesus drove this out. Now, you know, God set up sacrifice. God set up sacrifice. So Jesus, what the heck are you doing driving sacrifice out? But you see, he's not. He recognizes, and he, he doesn't just see things. He recognizes the spirit. He recognizes the true motive behind it, not the thing. We might walk in and go, isn't it great how the offerings have increased and how, you know, there's more stuff in the temple for us to be able to... And Jesus walks in and goes, give me some leather here. I need to make me a scourge and drive this stuff out. And we're going, why? Because we see things and we go, well, you know, this is... Things have been a lot better. It's a lot easier now when I come to the temple. I don't have to bring something from home. I just walk over here, throw down some bucks, pick out my thing, walk in there, kill it, come out and go, woo, I'm, a, I'm right with God now. You know? And they go, this is wonderful. This is progress. See? But Jesus looks at it and goes, man, you don't even know my spirit. You don't have a clue where I'm coming from. You know? And, and so you're missing this. Uh-huh. Right? Yes. I think it's past that now. I think it's just give me convenience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Period. Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you. That's, and that's right. It's just a matter of time. And that's where time is on your side because it will divide eventually. <clears throat> Amen. I wrote the, the, the oxen, the false spirit of servitude which wants to be honored for its work. Doesn't that really miss the real spirit of what it was meant to be? And so it has to be driven out. Um, <clears throat> I wrote not a prize cow at a fair or a breeding heifer, but an oxen patiently plowing every day from sunrise to sunset and gets the job done. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. 
to, to do that. Now, you find in the, in, in, in the church, you find a lot of people willing to serve. And a pastor learns how to utilize what he's got. But the bad thing is, is it is the pastor's responsibility not just to take advantage of somebody that wants to serve or to utilize somebody that wants to serve, but to determine what spirit they are of. Because that's important because whatever you let into your ministry or our ministry is going to affect part of the whole. If you don't believe that, you will find it out one day somewhere. But it is the truth. You, you become very careful, even to the degree that maybe some things could be met by somebody, but that person would end up being filled with pride and, you know, flaunting a spirit that is wrong. You know, let's say that you have somebody that is a, a great worship leader. They have wonderful talents, but every time they lead worship, you just get this sense of flesh. It's just yucky, you know. Instead of glory to God, you go, you know, you're... You feel like a prized cow is being, you know, paraded or something. And you go, you know, I'd rather have a lousy... Now, a lot, a lot of people would not rather have this. But hopefully you would say, I'd rather have a lousy worship service with the right spirit than this piano that goes... And everybody goes, wow, this is... You know, and that draws people but it's actually flesh that's drawing them and what sounds good to their ear that, that, make, that, that pleases them and they would be ones that would walk right past the, the manger in the barn that Jesus is in going, I'm looking for Jesus and they say he's in there and they go, he's not, you know, forget that. If it, you know, I think he's probably over here in a mansion or whatever because it didn't appeal to their senses. But if you're looking for Jesus, folks, and, and there's nothing wrong with, I like good piano music, so don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying the right spirit. You know, I'd love to have somebody that was just could go everywhere and beautiful and all this and have the right spirit. How about that? So I don't have, I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, cheesy for, for is, is, is what brings glory to God. That's not what I'm saying at all, okay? Cheesy is not what brings glory to God. The right spirit does. But sad to say, many of the better people have the wrong spirit and so sometimes sometimes you have to put up with cheese but you know what do you do it to the glory of God do you do it for God's glory to even put up with that in other words to, to settle for that you do it because it because you would rather have a right spirit than something that looks real good but it's not really bringing glory to God so um uh, Jesus said this in relation to take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly. You, you, you know, you just can't get away from it. You just can't get away from it. And there are many people, I've, I've seen it in the church, I mean, I had to grow and learn and I've made a lot of mistakes in the years, but I've had people that, that have given big offerings to the church and then because I didn't make a big enough deal about it to the church, they got mad and went, well, how come you didn't tell anybody I did all this or make a big deal out of it? And I'm going, gosh, man, I was, you know, because if I did, then you have your thanks, therefore you have your reward, and I'd really rather you get it from the Lord instead of having it right now. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm trying to do you a favor by not taking it from you right here. You know what I mean? But they don't see it like that and they get mad at you and think that you're being mean to them. And that's not your spirit at all. I mean, even in that, you're trying, you're trying to serve. You want that right spirit. And so, but, but that false thing of servitude wants to be honored for its worth. Wants somebody, you know, and I've, always, I've used this as an example because the Holy Spirit greatly impressed it on me. Jesus walking up Mount Calvary with that that uh, cross carrying it and falling down and and uh, so weak and and uh, so weak that somebody eventually had to help him but as he's carrying it up Mount Calvary lined on both sides with people we always think you know it's everybody going yeah go Jesus go yeah 
but instead they're all yelling and cursing and putting him down and whatever. And if you're going to serve Jesus, you may not, not in this lifetime, you may not. I mean, you may, and that's wonderful. If you can, that's good. And if God allows that, great. But that shouldn't be your spirit. That should be his prerogative to honor you if he so wishes. But your spirit should be, hey, I'm going to do what I've got to do, and I'll do it faithfully for as long as I have to because I'm not doing, I'm not, uh, serving in the sense of just laboring I am doing service to the Lord and so you know yeah I get tired yeah I, I you know yeah I you know I would like somebody to acknowledge that I'm doing something good but then you begin to think about it and you realize the spirit or the, or that it could lead towards that spirit because I, I don't think necessarily to think those things is bad but I think to meditate on them opens you to thoughts and things that starts demanding those things. Could. Could open you to those things. So, but I think it's human nature in the beginning just to go, you know, I mean, I think all of us would like to, if, if you've done a job well done, it's, you know, and the Bible says, as uh, you, uh, in Proverbs, it says, uh, if, you know, if it's in your hand to do it, do good to those that have served and done well. You know, if, if you can do that, and I, I try to do that, not to ever, and, and I almost always preface it when I do something like that, to go, this is not your reward, and, you know, I hope don't, you know, let's not take your reward from you, but I do appreciate this or that. That's what we have to do. All of us have to have that spirit. And, you know, it's Christ. It's not, no, it's not one man. It's not a way to, it's not, we're all selfish. <laughs> all. Me, you, we're all selfish. But Jesus isn't. And that's why we preach Christ and Him crucified. That's why we preach Christ. That's our only hope. It's our only hope. And then I was talking about the take my yoke upon you, and I wrote, um, the yoke chafes your neck when you're not in harmony with your yoke fellow. Do you know the scriptures, one place called, Paul called this uh, yoke fellow? Do you know that? There's one scripture where he says that. We're yoke fellow. And, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, you know, there was a law that said don't put an oxen and an ass in the same yoke. Anybody say amen? It makes absolute sense, doesn't it? It makes absolute sense. Because all you're going to do is end up with a chaff oxen neck who's trying to do it right patiently. And the oxen either wants to run ahead wildly, kicking its heels up, or sit down and stop. And the oxen is just steady. Not spectacular. He's not a racehorse. He's, not, he just, he's just steady. He just learned the value of good old-fashioned faithfulness. And it adds up, you know. Uh, take, take a penny a day and put it in a pot for the rest of your life that you live, and you will be a very rich person or put it in a bank. You'll be a very rich person at a certain juncture. Good old-fashioned, just line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It adds up. And God, I, you know, uh, we always say that scripture, and you hear people say it a lot. You've said it, I've said it. Uh, well, all I want to hear is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And a lot of that, for us, relates to, you did a good job. You know, I mean, isn't that kind of what we, you know, you did a good job. But he didn't just say good, but he said good and faithful. And that's right up there with good. <laughs> it's right up there with good. Just steady, just, you know, you know, most of us, and, and, and you find that with really committed people, you know, we always say things like, and I, you've heard it from me, you know, oh, I don't want to rust out, I'd rather blaze out, you know, or whatever. But the truth is, it's better. Just to be steady. I, I don't want to rust out, but I don't want to just be this shooting star that burns out and then it's gone. I want to be faithful and steady, and I want to be there for the long haul. You know, why? Because the Lord may need that long haul, so I want to. I want to learn. So you learn moderation in all things. You learn moderation in all things. You let moderation be your guide, so that when you start getting really too happy because you're giddy and everything's going well, you go, uh, 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 and you don't get sad. You just moderate. And when you're always just down in the doldrums and really getting down, down, you go, uh, moderation. And you learn not just that, but in all things. You learn moderation in all things. 
it really has some value. It's, it's called virtue. They are good virtues. Okay, sheep in relationship to sacrifice. What what do we what do we got? <laughs> obedience. Okay, I, you know a lot. Obedience, I think, really in a large way is more applied up here. But I also know that it has to be applied here. It has to be because the lamb lays down his life in obedience to the Father. So I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing. Uh huh. Willingness. willingness? Yeah, uh, yeah. That would be a real, real factor, wouldn't it? Willingness, because. The only sacrifice that God's going to accept is a willing sacrifice. You know, we, leaders, you can coerce somebody into doing something. You can manipulate them into doing something. And they may do it, but they're not really willing. But you, you put pressure on them. You knew just how to get them to do what you wanted to do. That doesn't please God at all. I'm just being honest. You... You're better off, we're better off not getting anything done than getting it done in a wrong spirit that is making people do things that they really don't want to do. And you know what? It really brings uh, disparagement on the kingdom of God because that person and other people walk by and what should be done joyfully as unto the Lord, heartily as unto the Lord is not done heartily. And somebody walks by and they see you doing it. And, and even if you don't just, well, I really didn't want to do this, but bless God, you know, I guess that's what serving Jesus is all about. And, you know, the pastor wanted me to do this, or so-and-so wanted me to do it, so I'll do it. You know, the truth is, and a lot of times people won't let you know if they're willing or not. They'll deceive you because they want to look good. Well, then that's their problem. But it's your responsibility as a leader to understand the mind of the Lord, the spirit, the way in which God operates. He never, ever, 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 ever wanted a sacrifice. It wasn't, first of all, willing. He doesn't want it, you know. And that maybe this is a time for you to reflect on things that you're doing. Maybe you're doing some things that you're really not willing to do. You say, but if I drop it, who will do it? Well, either it won't get done, and we've gone, let me tell you, this church has been through some really rough times. We've gone without in many areas. Uh, you know, we've gone without, uh, you know, you, I mean, my, my kids are just about out of teenage years. We've gone without, you know, for most of their teenage years, without one strong youth leader that would just lead, you know, and whatever. But, you know, if, if somebody's not willing and you stick them in there, what do you think is going to filter down to those kids? That's just one example. Well, what do you think? You know what I mean? What are you establishing? Okay, but gee, they didn't get all that they needed. No, they didn't. But they didn't, at least based on a right spirit and trying to follow God and trying not to put burdens on people that they really can't handle because you've got a program or that you want your kids taken care of or whatever, you know? So you learn. You just go, man... If I do without, I'm going to do without for the Lord's sake. I've had people come to me and go, well, why don't you just go, well, you know, why don't you just hire somebody to do that there job, you know? Come on, cough up some money to somebody. And I'm going, gosh, man, you know, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I don't mind paying anybody anything. In fact, I wish I could pay a lot of people. But I, not, you know, I'm not willing, but if you're going to fork over some bucks, I'll do it. You know, understand, that don't sound right to me. I don't know, what's wrong with this picture, you know what I mean? Uh, and I've had other people go, well, you know, get somebody in there, man. I mean, you'd have more people in your church if you had this and that and whatever. And I'm going, I, I would love to. <laughs> I mean, I would love to have the most on-fire nursery workers and, and the best, hottest children's church going in town. Hottest because it's following the Lord and the teachers are on fire from God and da-da-da-da-da. Not hottest because it's the biggest jam that drawing the most people to get more money. Wrong motive. This is talking about that. No, 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 no. Because it's hot because it's burning with the fire of God in its heart. That's what I want. And if only three people show up, that's the hottest in town. That's what I want, you know. But, you know, well, why don't you get somebody in here and do this? And I go, man, I would give anything. I would give anything. 
to have that kind of a deal. But we don't have that kind of deal, and I'm not going to, you know, start preaching on Sundays, pump a bunch of people up, get them pumped up for about two months, then they wear out, then the program's fully going, then it falls apart because they don't care anymore. Does that make sense? You know, so you just go, think we'll do without, and then everybody goes, well, hey, your church is really lacking. And you go, yeah, maybe we're lacking some of the things Jesus will have to come drive out at some junction. You know what I mean? I mean, I, mean, I, would, I think I'd rather, you know, he'd walk in and go, ain't got much going on here, do you? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Instead of going, wow, what a big church. <laughs> Rick. I think, you know, really to find a, the, I think there really is a fine line between these two, and that fine line needs to be found because I think really that consistency and that falling and getting up and that labor and that obedience and that serving and that sh is, is really, really found in the ox. And I think the sheep really, uh, by and large, isn't representing that long term, that so much continuing on as much as it's representing just flat self-surrender and death. Just flat self-surrender and death. You know what I mean? Because I mean, it dies. I mean, it, it's not continuing to, you know, some, uh, some people think of death as that way. Some sort of morbid, you know, we just got to die daily in that sense of uh, just this morbid, always dying. Well, no, 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 no. We, 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 have, we are crucified with Christ. And we recognize that, and that cross works in us, but it's not like we're trying to come to that, no? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Jerry? Yes. Yeah, yes, that's that's good too. That's really good. I, I really believe that. Man, I believe that. I, I believe that. Uh, someone that truly lays down their life. You know, and the Bible says, you know, we all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world, gave his love. But 1 John 3.16 says, by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And that, that laying down of our lives is, is the Lamb's spirit. It is his spirit within us. We won't do that. And his spirit, if, it, if he was, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he is, this way in Isaiah 53 and then this way when he comes at the end of the Gospels and lays down his life and opens not his mouth, would he not be this way in you and I where he doesn't go, look, I'm innocent and I tell you what, most of you people are just off, but I'm going to go ahead and lay down my life. You know what I mean? That's not his spirit at all. So I really, I believe there is this quietness uh, uh, in relationship to him. Good. And uh, then uh, Mallory mentioned a particular word that I also have in my notes. Um, a false spirit of self-surrender. Uh, this is the, the false now. Or what I term a martyr spirit. A martyr spirit. A martyr spirit. Um, I've seen this so, and it took me years to really recognize the difference uh, because I would see people that would, 
willingly lay down their life in certain situations, it appeared. But then with that came this, oh, poor me. You know, I mean, I'm giving myself and nobody's noticing or, or, or poor me. Uh, you know, I'm really doing without and I'm really, but, but I'm really serving God. But, oh, man. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's a, and, and, and I didn't recognize it for years, and I would see it in, in people, and I'm going to give you a little warning. I mean, everybody's going to see this, and, you know, if the Lord delays his coming, and I die, and you're left in leadership and positions and helping people, you will run across it, and the way that you'll begin to identify it is, it feels really yucky, and Jesus feels really clean. I mean, that's the only way I know how to put it. Molly? Well, and certainly, and certainly that's true in the right sense that the sheep follow the shepherd. Right. But you're saying in the... Right. Absolutely. And that is very much an attribute of a sheep is they follow. Very, very much. Uh-huh. Gordon? That's true, and, and uh, that's, you know, a, a lamb is not meant to follow horses. It's meant to follow a shepherd and, or, or a mature sheep. And um, the, I'll tell you what, just a, just a good old-fashioned study of sheep is real interesting. It's real interesting. I mean, when I became a pastor, I thought it would probably be a good idea to, to do that. And I remember seeing pictures as a kid where this flock would be running and somebody would be riding on a horse and would head straight for the flock, and the flock was running. And it was like a river. It would just part and go like this. I mean, it was like a helicopter view down. And it would just part, and that horse would go right through. And they would go like this, and then they would just flow back together as one. It's really, the, they are very much a communal type thing. They don't like, you know, going off. It's usually the lambs, the immature ones, that end up going off and doing stuff. But the others know, hey, the best thing to do is hang with the body. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Right. Right. Well, in lot. Oh, it's disastrous. And a lot of times that is pressure from the parents who want them to straighten their kid out, and because they're not, they haven't done a good job or whatever. When, you know, and the deal is, I mean, it almost it seems so rare nowadays to find anybody that goes, look, I just want the Lord, and I want, you know, I want my kids to know the Lord, and I want, you know, I want my life to be basically to serve the purposes of God in my generation, but. You know, it happens. Um, so, now, remembering that this all comes out of chapter 1, we're still only in chapter 2. And in chapter 1, we found the Logos, which is the complete thought and concept of God. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word, 
so that was before all things that created all things. So then you have us, and here I'm going to draw this the mind. And this is the, the temple of our mind, and in there we have all these concepts of, of dove and sheep and stuff that are wrong concepts. It's these concepts that look, they're religious. They're not Christ. They're religious. And so when, when the Logos comes into the temple of our mind, boom, 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 it drives out all of these things, all these concepts, all this stuff, and he is set up as Logos, not just now in general, but specifically in us, the Logos. You know, it's not just some concept we believe that he's the Word, the Logos. He's the complete concept and thought of the Father. Now he has come into his temple, and now he has set up his kingdom in us. And, he, and the only way he can do that, folks, is he's got to drive out some stuff. And, and in this case, these aren't, this isn't like uh, adulterers and murderers and This is religious concepts that appear right and good, but that it's not Christ. That, that lamb that just went running down the street is not the lamb of God. It is a mar martyr spirit. That dove that just flew out was not the Holy Spirit. It was our continued attempts to peace at all costs and, and, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, let's see. And his disciples, verse 17 says, and his disciples remembered that it was written. Now, how are you going to remember it was written unless you've been reading the Word, the Scriptures? Amen? And, and you, you say, well, I, you know, when I read that, it didn't really click in. But when I got in this situation over here with the Lord, I remembered. Once again, Read the Word and don't always expect to get something the moment you read. You, you're not just reading it to get something. You read it, and you may not even realize that you got something. Two days later, you're in a situation with the Lord, and then you remember, and then it all makes sense. Trust the Lord. Don't have this, oh, i got to see something, or I'm not of God, or God isn't with me, or I must have done so, I must have sinned. Well, are you aware of any? No, but God ain't showing up, so I must have done something. You know, whatever. I don't. You know, I can't even think of all the weird concepts we could come up with. I just know that the Lord is faithful. The Lord is always with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Paul said to Timothy, the guy under him, that he was supposed to disciple, give attention to reading. Just read. Quit trying to always get a sermon. Just read and trust God. He found those, that I'm going to read, I'm going to read, I'm going to give attention to read. These are my notes. He found those that sold animals and changed money. The temple and the Passover had become a great place of merchandising. Now, I don't know if you've been looking around the last 15 years. It was a place to go and make some money. I can't wait for the Passover. Why? Because a lot of people will be coming and we can profit from the temple and the Passover. They had a materialistic gospel. The, the Passover and temple should not be to our profit. The Passover and temple should not be to our profit, but a place for our loss. I've talked about the altar. Used to be the altar call was a place where you went and gave up something. Nowadays, it's a place where you go and get something. It's a place we go get. It's all changed. The true cross has been thrown out, and there's this other sheep, this other cross that's being preached and received, and it's not of God. And, and I'm not, and I'm not my, my point is not trying to be critical of others as much as if we know the truth, there'll be a contrast, but we're not trying to put down. We just want to know and maintain the truth and stay with the truth. That's what we're after. Um, we must become so consumed by the zeal for the Lord's house and eaten up with it that if any such prophet gospel should enter the doors of this temple, we would take the scourge and drive it out. Jesus said, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. But if I center in on the thing of making booths and selling tapes and etc. for man's profit, 
that's a big part of the ministry. Well, it's only a third. My God. Oh, it's only a third. A third seems like an awful lot to be shoving Jesus out, you know. Uh, and I think, and, and now, you know, if I go, well, actually, I don't do a lot. But you all know I do a lot of conferences and stuff, and sometimes I sell books or tapes or whatever. To be honest with you, I was reminded of this. Deb told me the other day, or somebody told me the other day, I used to go do these conferences and set up this little table because my motivation was I wanted people to have the word. And people come back and look at it and they go, oh, I don't have any money. And then I'd come back and, and I'd give it all to Deb and she go, well, how many books are sold? And I go, well, seven. She goes, oh, good. And how many tapes? Well, about ten. Says, oh, okay, well, where's the money for it? And I go, well, I kind of gave them all away. <laughs> and she said, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with selling them if, if people are hungry and whatever. You, that's not what I'm talking about. But if there is a spirit of merchandising, if that's a big deal, if that's a big part of it, you better watch out. Uh, to me, man, I want people to have the word. I mean, we like the tapes that we sold, I mean, unbelievably low prices. The books are almost always, they're, they're right at what it costs, plus a little extra, though we never have seemed to be able to charge that little extra so that we could print more, so that we could have them for the next time around, you know? There's nothing wrong with those kind of things. But folks, there is a spirit in the church world that is a merchandising spirit that is doing it and looking forward to the profits it's going to get out of this little deal. And it's become a, a whole lot of the ministry is wrapped up in merchandising. And Jesus said, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. All I know is I don't want to do that. I don't, I'm not pointing the finger. I just don't want to do that. I want my father's house to be a place that people can come and meet my father. You know? Uh -huh. Great. It's a bestseller. Yeah. It's a bestseller. But you walk in any bookstore where they're, what's the latest bestseller, and they're pretty expensive. But they ain't 80, 100 bucks. <laughs> I found this great deal outside Walmart. They had a tent and they were selling books, and they had some really cool Bibles. Good price. 12 bucks. I was just going, whoa, yes. And they look nice, and they were leather and everything. Eric? That's true, too. That's right. Well, and along with that, I don't, I think in the right place, I don't feel bad about condemning the selling of books and stuff when it's done in a merchandising spirit because Jesus didn't seem too hung up about it when he walked in there and drove them all out. But, but, but I, the reason why I'm putting kind of the spirit that I'm putting is because we have a tendency to be critical and to think we're something if we don't do that, and that is not Jesus either. Okay? So... But uh, I would love for us to take the right spirit, which the right spirit, if you have a zeal for the Lord, might even say, that's wrong. You know, in fact, in my notes, I, I didn't even finish the sentence, but I said, but if I center in on the thing of making booze, selling tapes for man's profit, it will probably feel like a scourge and you'll hate me for it when I begin to 
speak against that. Um, so I don't, even that, I don't have a problem with speaking out. And I think you're exactly right. I think that, I think, I think Christian people are some of the chinchiest people around. And they need to quit making fun of us Jews because Christians are, <laughs> right, Eric? <laughs> See, Eric, ha Eric has this deal. He goes, that's a, what is that? A, uh, we put on all Jews that they're penny pinchers. And, but it's not true. Not all Jews are that way. That's right. Of course, that was the Son of God, the Spirit of the Lamb. But Yeah. Yeah, probably. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Right. That's good. That's very good. Sure, they they probably were. Back the next day for the rest, I mean, and, you know. But, well, sometimes you feel like slapping the fire at them, but the best thing to do is lay down your life. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Amen. Okay, the zeal of, the, of thine house has eaten me up. He, he became a protector of the house of God. And I think that's the real point, not even the necessarily the cleansing, but the zeal of the Lord that works in you, the desire for that which is in God's heart. That, that will never cease. That cannot, if it's really in you, it, it will consume you. It will, another way to say that is it will eat you up. The zeal of the house of the Lord has eaten me up. It will consume you. And, uh, you know, and a lot of Christians are not consumed. They're not eaten up with anything. And that's the fact. They're not eaten up with anything. They're not. They just... They're just Christians, and they, you know, they, they, they go to church when it's convenient, and they serve God when it's convenient, and whatever. But there needs to be more of an eat, being eaten up with this, you know, consumed, the zeal consuming you. <clears throat> he was consumed with one thing, to bring forth the glory of the Father in the temple. And that's a good motivation. It's a good motivation. Uh, nothing else matters or is a motivating factor. And then Jesus spoke of the temple of his body when he... What he did in the outward temple, he signified what should be true of his body. His zeal for it will not allow such things in. And, uh, you know, once again, just to point out, I mean, we're always... We're always after the most wicked sins and all this and that, and I have no problem with that. But I noticed that Jesus had more trouble with the Pharisees than he did with the sinners. The sinners were still sinners, but they ended up following him, and they wouldn't stay that way. He don't leave you that way. You'd be transformed into a saint. But you got to follow. you got to continue. But if you know it all, and you got your dove, and you got your ox and your sheep, and all your things in there, and those are your righteousness, and those are your stand with God, and those are the things that you think brings approval, and those are your ways, your ways of... Um, man, I had a wonderful time with the Lord today, and this, I was searching in uh, Genesis um, chapter 12, and just, it was so cool. I don't know when I, if I... I may never get a chance to share it because it was just stuff I was enjoying. But um, it just occurred to me when I was reading there that Abraham... Uh, had been an idol worshiper. He was a Chaldean. His name was Abram. He'd never, ever met God. All he'd ever known was idol worship. And, and all of a sudden, God appeared to him. The supreme being of the universe met with man, and they started relating. And I just went, 
man, I just I wanted to I wanted to get in on this thing. You know what I mean? That, now I want to look at this. You know what happened? And it is so exciting what happened as the Lord showed it to me, because. It's not first found in the words because he, all he says is leave your family and leave your kindred and go and da 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 da. And the Holy Spirit just like pulled back the veil and showed me what, I don't know how to put I'll share sometime. Maybe. Just all this stuff, the real stuff. And you don't see it if you just read ink on white paper. And we just go, well, the supreme being of the universe says leave this place and go over this other place. We're going, that's it? That's the message of, that's the, the big plan, that's, you know what I mean? I don't know, you know, but I'm just going, you know, I mean, here is God and man have come together. <laughs> Boom, man. And then the Holy Spirit just shows me, and it's not in the words. I mean, you can see things in the word, but it's not in the words. He started showing me relationship. Anyway. Did I get all this read? Yeah. Okay. It's time to quit. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your son that you've given us and who is our life, our Lord, our everything. Father, we just, we just, we just love you. We look to you. We look to your Holy Spirit that you've given us, not just to do great things through us in ministry, but we look to the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, that we may be conformed to the image of Christ, that Christ and Him crucified will be our message and everything else will just follow those that believe. Father, we love You. We thank You that uh, Your Spirit is here and He's already doing these and He's just going to continue doing greater and You're going to receive the glory for it and we thank You for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're